Well, hey, good morning, Oasis Church. Welcome to Church Online from our new building here on Parham Road. Thanks so much for tuning in with us. Maybe this is your first time. Maybe you've been part of our church family for a, for a while. Maybe this just popped up on your news feed. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We're excited to, to have church and to get in God's Word together. I was thinking this morning about our identity in Christ. There's a phrase that the Bible uses to describe followers of Jesus time and time again, and it's that we are hidden in Christ. Hidden in Christ. And if, if you put your faith in Jesus this morning, or maybe you haven't, but you made that decision this morning, I just want to speak this truth over you that you are hidden in Christ. That phrase, that terminology, it's, it's a phrase of identity. It's a phrase of security. It's a phrase of protection. That, that you are hidden in Christ. You're shielded by Christ. That anything that comes at you has got to come through Christ. That anything that gets to you has to come through Christ first. That you are hidden in Christ. And for some of you this morning, you might feel like all oh, hell is broken loose in your life. It might feel chaotic right now. You might feel like attack after attack after attack is coming after you. And I just want to declare today that you are hidden in Christ. It's your identity today. That's your protection today. That's the shield of God around you. That's your security today. It doesn't come from things you see on the outside. It comes from your identity in Christ. You are hidden with him. You're hidden with him. And so, Lord, I thank you today. I thank you this morning, Lord, that those of us that have put our faith in you, that your word declares over and over and over again that we are hidden in Christ. Lord, thank you for the security that comes with that name. Thank you for the protection. Thank you for the identity. Thank you for the confidence that comes in who we are and who you are. And Father, I pray over these next few moments as we gather around your word, Lord, as we watch in living rooms and homes and apartments and in vehicles and Lord, everywhere that our church is gathered, as we tune in together this morning, Lord, I pray that you would do what I cannot, and that is change our hearts and change our lives today. Lord, I pray that after we finish this time together, Lord, I pray we wouldn't have just watched a video, Lord, watched a, a news feed, but Lord, I pray we'd hear from you. So Lord, speak to us this morning, open our hearts, open our ears, that we might receive from you and your word today. Lord, thank you for the gift of technology. Thank you for the opportunity to gather virtually in this season. God, thank you for the privilege it is to gather to worship and to lift up your name and around your word. So Father, change our hearts today in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, somebody type in the comments below, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, worship team. And uh, if you were seated in your living room or your kitchen, or maybe you're making breakfast, you got some eggs. Eggs are good. Maybe uh, wherever you are, if, if you can grab your seat, and uh, if you've got a Bible that's accessible to you, if you got a Bible over in the next room, uh, wherever, go, go ahead and grab it. Uh, I'm excited to get in the Word today. I'll give you a minute to get your Bible, and um, welcome to Church Online. As I said, we are here at our brand new church building, our brand new location uh, that we just got a little over a month ago here on Parham Road. You guys can probably see uh, the cars going by behind me here on Parham. We're in the corner of the lobby uh, where we've set up online church this morning that we're gonna be bringing to you for this next short season uh, as we continue to get the building ready. And I just wanna tell you, uh, it's on its way. Uh, every day there's people in here. Every day it's looking a little bit better. Every day we're, we're getting closer to the finish line. And it's very important for us uh, to, to make sure the first time we open these doors to our city that it's excellent, that it's safe, that it's clean for everybody that comes through, from, from the lobby to the auditorium to the Oasis Kids environment. We wanna create an excellent, safe, clean environment, and so we just need a little bit longer to do that, and so uh, thank you for so many of you that are giving faithfully during this time. Um, every, every single thing that's happening around here, every day, every step we get closer to this building opening is because of your faithful giving, and so thank you so much for those of you that are investing into God's house uh, to prepare this place, and even 
as we've worshiped in here just for the last few moments, it just gets me pumped to think about uh, the things God is gonna do in this place. It gets me pumped to, to just think about in this next room over here, the people that are gonna experience God's presence for the first time, the people that are lost and, and don't believe the gospel, are gonna hear the gospel for the first time in this room right here, and they're gonna respond. They're gonna become followers of Jesus. They're gonna become hidden in Christ. There's people that are struggling uh, with all kinds of things. God's gonna set them free. Just behind where the camera is is the whole Oasis kids wing and I think about the next generation in this place that's going to get raised up the future world changers not even future the world changers now the future disciples the future uh, pastors and leaders future business leaders future moms and dads that are going to uh, raise up the next generation of disciples so I think about all that that's going to happen right behind where these cameras are mounted today in the Oasis kids wing and it just gets me excited and I could go on and on and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you guys more and show you more each week but let's get into God's word can I do that so I don't ramble for too long? Is that good? All right, God's word. Uh, go to the book of 3 John. 3 John. It's towards the end of your Bible. And uh, this, this book, I'm really excited about it. What we're gonna do today, I'm gonna read a scripture for us. And it's gonna be really short. And so uh, don't miss it, okay? Don't miss it. Uh, 3 John, verse number one is what I'm gonna read, okay? 3 John 1. Here's what the scripture says. The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. That's it for today. See, I told you, y'all weren't ready for it. Y'all aren't ready for one verse. All right, let's read it again. Third John, verse one, ready? The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. I, I'm excited about this next month. I'm excited about this next short season because what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a brand new collection today called Walking in the Truth, Walking in the Truth, and it's gonna be a collection on the book of 3 John. It's gonna be a collection on the book of 3 John. It's something that we're gonna to begin to implement into the calendar each year as a church that will we'll take some time, we'll take some seasons throughout the year where we just look at one book of the Bible and we kinda walk through that book. We kinda walk through from start to finish what that book, what that author is telling us in the scripture. We do a lot of different collections about a lot of different things and so we're gonna begin to implement this throughout the calendar and, and our first one, I'm so excited about it, is on 3 John, 3 John. And the book of 3 John is, it's one, honestly, that I don't, it's never really like talked about, you know, it's like, you're not like talking about your favorite Bible verses, or you don't see like 3 John on like coffee mugs and stuff, <laughs> like, it's not one that's like discussed or talked about that often. In fact, 3 John is actually the shortest book in the New Testament. It's the shortest book in the New Testament. It's only, it's only one chapter. In the Greek language that it was first written in, it's only 273 Greek words, that's it. So like it's a short paragraph for, the, for my online students, it's a quick discussion board. It's a last minute discussion board. It's, it's, it's a short, brief book, the shortest one in the New Testament. And so we're gonna be looking at this over the next several weeks and uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you some homework here right out the gate uh, to start out this season, to start out this collection and that is read the whole book of 3 John, the one chapter, every day this whole month. I just read it every day for this whole month. So for the next several weeks as we're going through it, um, it, it, it'll take some of you one or two minutes. It'll take a few, four or five minutes. It is, it's short. But, 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 but the goal for this month is that we digest and dig into what John would tell us in the book of 3 John. Before we even get into it today, though, I thought I would lay a, a framework, lay a groundwork for what we're about to do as we study this book. Because it's important how you study the Bible. And if, if I could just teach us, teach our church, teach, teach us this morning uh, how we study the Bible, how, how we look at God's word, particularly when we're looking at one book, when we're looking at just this book and we're gonna go all the way through it, um, how to do this, best practices for, for doing it. If I could this morning, I, I'm just gonna take you like a little Bible school class. I had a school, I had a class in Bible school called Inductive Bible Study 350. 
Okay, so, so if I could just give you like the first intro class this morning, is that okay? To Inductive Bible Study 350, and you don't have to pay for it. These credit hours are free. Come on, somebody. Type in, type in, in the comments below. Free is for me. Come on, free is for me. Inductive Bible Study, how, how, how we study the Bible. And these, these principles, these tools that I want to equip, equip us with this morning is, is what I try to use every single week when we look at God's word and what I want us to do over this next month as we look at Third John. I think it's gonna help us and lay a good framework and groundwork as we study it in the weeks to come. Does that sound good? So, so here's, here's the first thing that I wanna talk about this morning. When it comes to scripture, particularly looking at a book as we study a book, I want you to know this, context is key. Context is key. In fact, it's so key, I want you to comment a key emoji in the comments below. Just put the key emoji. Context is really key. Here's, here's what context means. When, when you're looking at a, a passage in scripture, there's some questions to ask. Here's some good questions to ask. And if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write these down. Here's some questions. Every time you look at the Bible, every time you open this book, every time you read a scripture, here's some things we should be asking ourselves. The, so the first one is this. Who is writing this text? Who's writing this text? The second one is, who are they writing to? Not only who's the author, but who's the audience? Where's where's this intended to go? Who who were the intended eyes for the author putting this to pen? The third one is this, when are they writing the text? What's the cultural uh, norm? What's what, what kind of uh, culture are they in? What time frame are they in? What's going on amongst the culture and the cities and the people at the time that they're writing it? When are they writing it? And the fourth question that we need to ask when we look at the scripture is this, why are they writing this text? What's their purpose behind it? What's motivating them to put ink to paper to, to send this text, to, to, to put this down, to send it to who they're sending it to. These questions can help give you context when we read God's word. It, 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 help us, it helps us know the intended meaning. Look, context helps me understand something that I wouldn't be able to understand without it. Yeah. I don't wanna say that again, I want you to write that down. Context, it helps me understand something that I wouldn't be able to understand without it. Yeah. All right, so, so for example, I got this letter here, and I'm gonna open this letter. This is, just, this is just a letter, okay? I just found this letter, okay? I got this letter, and on this letter, is we're gonna open it up. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a letter. I don't know if the camera can see that, if, if we can zoom in on this here. Uh, it says this, we can't believe it pack your bags. It's like, you know, so for the people here in the lobby that are watching this here this morning uh, live, it's just kind of like puzzled faces. Probably everybody at home too is like, what are, you, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, we can't believe it, pack your bags. Like, okay, th- this, this is not really, this is more confusing than helpful, right? Seeing this, no idea what you're saying, no idea what you're talking about. How many know uh, what would be helpful would be to see who it's from, and then who it's to. How many know if it's from the Center for Rent Convictions, or not convictions, evictions, how many know uh, if you're getting an eviction notice and it says, uh, we can't believe it, pack your bags, because the context of this letter was you just met with your landlord uh, once a week for the past month about you being late, and now you're finally way past late, and now you finally get the letter, and it's from your landlord about evicting, about evicting, and it says, pack your bags. How many know that context gives this letter some fearful, frightening, saddening tones to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh, if I know that, this, is a t- this letter's awful, oh, gosh. How many know if this is from Walt Disney Award Prizes and the context of it is the last few weeks you've been applying to Disney giveaways online every single Tuesday at 5.05 p.m. so that you can win a free trip to Disney and you get that in the mail. We can't believe it. Pack your bags. How many know you're like, let's go. This is good. This is like we... The tone and the spirit in which you read this is drastically different than if it's an eviction notice. 
What's, what's the difference there? What changes the spirit? What helps you understand it? Context is key. Yeah. Context gives you the meaning. Context gives you the direction behind what's being written here. Why is this so important when we read God's word? It's because if you don't know its purpose, you'll misinterpret its principles. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know its purpose, you'll misinterpret its principles. Look, the power and the heart and life transformation that comes from God's word comes from the true intended meaning of God's word. That's why context is key. That's why we have to ask these questions. That's why we have to dig in every time we look at God, at his word and get context. And there's, there's probably examples all of us know. I know there's examples I see all the time where this is not utilized and this goes bad. Like here's some famous ones. Maybe I'll step on your toes this morning. You ready? You ready? Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. You heard of this one? This is, this is one of the most famously quoted, like it's on coffee mugs, like it's on every graduation card. Like, oh, you did it, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Anybody heard this? If you heard this in the comments below, just, just wave at me. Uh, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Well, okay, context is key. Who's writing this? Well, it's a prophet. What is a prophet? It's a prophet is someone who speaks to God's people on behalf of God. He's God's spokesperson. He's God's press secretary. He's God's mouthpiece to God's people in the Old Testament. It's a prophet. And so Jeremiah was a prophet. And, and so when is he writing this? What's going on in Jeremiah 29? Well, let's back up a little bit to Jeremiah 28. In Jeremiah 28, there's a false prophet. Like, like a guy that's not hearing from God, but acting like a prophet and speaking lies. And here's what the false prophet says to God's people. You guys are gonna be free from captivity. You guys are not gonna be captives to Babylon. You're, gonna, you're about to enter into freedom, and, and you're, you're not gonna be captives, and, and you're about to enter into the great season. And Jeremiah and God rebuke this false prophet in chapter 28. And then Jeremiah, in chapter 29, steps up and says, actually, that guy that just told you the message that all y'all liked because it was a good message, actually, he was wrong. Here's the message from God. You're not about to be set free. You're about to be captives for 70 years. So like Jeremiah 29, 11, the context is not exciting. It's very bad. You are about to be a captive to Babylon. You're about to be in exile for seven decades. And then he says, hey, but while you're captives there, you're still gonna build homes in a foreign land. You're still gonna plant gardens. You're gonna grow trees. You're gonna have families. You're gonna establish a life. Even when you're in a foreign land, even when you're in exile, you will still prosper. There's still a hope. There's still a future. That's where 2911 is. There's a hope and a future even in a bad context. So the context of Jeremiah 2911 it is not for high school graduation. <laughs> the context is even when you're in a tough season, God can bring about good things. Even when I'm going through something that's tough, God can still establish his work in my life. Context is key. How about another one, another famous one is this, Proverbs 22, six. Have you guys heard this one? Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's how people read this first. They say, oh, so if I raise my child like in church, and if I teach them God's word, then my child will never walk away from the Lord. What, well, if you've ever lived and observed people and generations and lives, you you know that's not true. I, I, I know I've seen people that have been raised in a godly home that have walked away from Christ. I know I've seen people that have been taught the word of God at a young age, but, but, they, but they've turned away from Christ, but yet the Proverbs is saying, if you train up a child in the way they will go, they will not depart from it. Well, you have to know the context. You have to know the style of writing in the Proverbs. These, these are, not, are not sure, fire, certain truths in the Proverbs. They're principles that are saying, hey, if, 
if you raise up a child in the ways of God, you're, they're, they're a lot more likely to, to, to come to Christ. They're a lot more likely to walk in the ways of God. If, if you're gonna look at the next generation and if you want them to walk in the ways of God, what should you do? Should you ignore them and neglect them or should you train them up? Well, you should train them up so that we hope that God, that's what we do at our church when we pray over the children and we do child dedication, that's what we're doing. We're saying, Lord, we, we, we can't make these kids decide anything. They've gotta decide for themselves, but Lord, we're gonna train them up. Lord, we're gonna pray over and we're gonna do our job knowing and believing that you're gonna do yours in the future. Context is key. Context is key. And if, if you don't have the right context, you won't be able to approach God's word and get the true meaning out of it. You can misinterpret it if you have the wrong context. Here's, here's my favorite one. It was the last one. And I'm, I'm preaching now to middle school Nate, okay? I'm preaching now to my middle school self. My favorite one. I actually had this, <laughs> my first car when I was 16 years old, a Chrysler Concorde. It was my first Chrysler Concorde when I was 16. This like super old car. It was my great grandfather's car. I had this verse on my license plate, okay? This was me. This was middle school, high school, Pastor Nate, Philippians 4.13, you heard this one? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's how I use that in middle school. I can make the basketball team. <laughs> Let's go. I can do all things. I can beat the guys that are way taller and more athletic than me. I can do all things through Christ. Like, oh, I can pass this test. Oh my gosh, I didn't study, but I can pass it because I can do all things. How many know context is key? Yeah. Context is key. Uh, who was writing that? Paul. Why was he writing, he was, in, he was in jail. He was writing to a church plant that he planted from jail, and he was talking about, I've suffered, I've had plenty, I've had few, and the context of that scripture is, no matter where I've been, no matter what I've had, I've learned to be content so I can do all things. Whether I'm high on the mountaintop, I can be content, I can do all things. Whether I'm low in the valley and in prison, I can be content because I can do all things, because my contentment doesn't come from my situation, my contentment comes from Christ. I can do all things. So, so my middle school self needed to hear, no, 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 Nate, you can't make the basketball team because you're not good enough. You can be content when you get cut because you can do all things. That is the context. Are you with me this morning? Are you with me at church online this morning? Context is key. Over the next few weeks, as we look at 3 John, that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be, what's the context? What is, what is the, 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 the story, the picture, the author, the audience? What is God's word? saying to us, and I've got three things that I wanna give us really quick, and then I wanna pray about how we're gonna approach God's word, how we're gonna approach his word, and, and how we're gonna approach specifically Third John over the next few weeks. The first one is this, approach God's word with the spirit of humility. Approach God's word with the spirit of humility. The spirit in which you approach God's word will determine what you receive from his word. All right, I wanna say this, and I wanna say this clear, and I wanna say this strong this morning. We have to read the Bible for what it truly says, not what we want it to say. We have to read the Bible for what it truly says, not for what Nate wants it to say. And, and I, th this approach to God's word, I know saying this, I can even feel it in some of y'all this morning through the screen. I know it's kind of like uncomfortable and it seems, it seems kind of like old school or too demanding or whatever, but, but I'm telling you, this approach to God's word is what we need and it's, it's, it's actually best for you. Yes, that's right. All right, so I'll explain this. I'll explain this. Um, a few weeks ago, actually it's probably been a month or so ago now, uh, I, I got stitches like, like stitches, I got cut. I got stitches for the first time in my life. And if you know anything about me, medical scenes is not my strong point. Like, like, I, like I see a cut and then I'm on the ground as white as a ghost sweating passed out. Like I don't do needles, I don't do like medical environments with medical equipment and beeping machines and stuff. It's not good for me, okay, I'm out, okay? If you wanna get me out, just start giving, start drawing blood from people or something, I'm done, all right, I'm out. And, and so for the very first time, all my years, I, was, I had a good streak going and uh, I, I got a cut on my arm and so I had to go to a patient first and my wife, and she took so good, she took such good care of me. But with COVID and stuff, you know, like they didn't even let her back there. So like, 
I had to go back and I'm back there sitting. And the whole time I'm telling her this on the way to patient first and stuff. I'm like trying to look at it, but not too much because if I see it, like it, it's kinda, it was kind of deep and stuff and I just, I didn't want to see it. So I'm like trying to convince her. I'm like, oh, it's not, it's not that bad. Like it's, it's good. It's, it's not that bad. Like, oh, they have this, they have this glue thing. Have y'all heard about this? I'm like, I don't need stitches. I, I, he can just like dab it, the little glue thing, and then just pinch my arm back together. And I, I, I just need like a little, like, you know, an art class in school, a little dab will do you. Like, just give me a little bit of glue in the arm. That's all I need, some glue. I don't need stitches, no needles, no numbing, no, no, just, just a little bit of glue and a Band-Aid, you know? And, and so I'm telling her this, and she's like, no, it looks deep, it looks pretty deep. I think it's gonna need stitches. I'm like, no, it needs glue, it needs glue, it needs glue. And so I get back there, and I'm sitting in the room, and the doctor finally comes in and talk to him. I'm like, yeah, I just cut my arm on a screw, and, and you know, I, I think I just need some glue. Like, I'm telling the doctor, I'm like, I, 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 I'm just here to just get a little bit of glue, just you squeeze it together real quick, just a little bit of glue is all I need. And then he just peeks at my elbow real quick. He goes, ooh, yeah, no, I was gonna need a few stitches. I, no, I need some glue, doc. I need some glue for sure. Is there another doctor here? Yeah, let's talk to another doctor. I think I need some, sti- I think I need some glue. Like, and he just looked at me, no, 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 you, you need stitches. Like, what I wanted and preferred was glue. What I needed was stitches. Okay, if, if, if I go into the doctor with a sickness or an injury, I, I, I need to approach that doctor not with my preferences, but with his knowledge and, and, and his, his demands. Because how many, what I really wanted was healing, and if, if I would have approached it with my preferences and patched it with glue, I wouldn't have actually got what I wanted. I would have hurt myself in the long run. I needed not what I wanted, I needed what he knew to get me where I actually wanted to go. We need to approach God's word not with what we wanted to say, not with our preferences, not with our opinions. We need to approach it saying, God is God and I am not God, whatever you have to to say to me, I'm approaching it from a standpoint of humility. I want you to speak to me what you want me to hear. We're approaching it not with what we wanted to say, but with what it, what it says. We have to approach God's word ready for our mind to be renewed, ready for our lives to be shaped, not ready for our preferences to be affirmed. We gotta approach God's word with the spirit of humility, but we don't just approach it with the spirit of humility, we have to approach God's word with a desire for understanding. The desire for understanding. Here is where we go beyond just knowing what it says, here's where we go to understanding what it says. There's a difference between being aware of something and understanding something. If I've got issues in my car, I can be aware that my transmission is bad, but that doesn't mean I understand it. I could be aware that my car needs work and that the steam coming out and smoke coming out is no bueno. I can be aware that it's broken, but that doesn't mean I understand what the problem is or I understand the solution and what's needed to get me there. Knowing it and understanding it are two different ways and we don't just need to know God's word, we need to understand his word. It says this in Ephesians chapter five, verse number 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't just need to know God's will. I don't just need to know God's word. I need to move beyond knowledge, and I need to understand God's word. As we look at 3 John over the next few weeks, what we're doing as we dive into this is we're, is we're not just seeking to know what it says or read it plainly, but we're looking to understand what God would say to us. As we talked a few weeks ago on our uh, first year birthday, our, part of our vision over the next year is to grow in spiritual depth. Part of that involves understanding more of God's word, understanding more of what his word says. Here is where studying God's word comes into play. It's where studying, it's where when you look at God's word on your own at your, at your house throughout the week, it's where you ask the questions, who's writing this? Where are they writing it? Why are they writing it? When are they writing it? I mean, look, this is, this is why studying is important. Like Leviticus says, you're not supposed to have tattoos. Like, 
what, I'm not supposed to have tattoos? Is that right? Pastor has a tattoo on his hand. Like, is pastor in sin? Or what, what, it says you're not supposed to have. The apostle Paul says he wishes everyone was single and not married like he is. What do you, so Paul, Paul's against marriage? God's not for marriage? The apostle Paul says he wishes everyone was single. What does he mean? This is, this is why we have to study God's word. What, what, what does he mean? Are, are tattoos wrong? Should everyone be single? Should I not be excited at a wedding? This is where we grow in understanding, right? We grow in under, understanding. How about, how about where the Bible says to return 10% of your income to the local church? Am I really supposed to do that? Like, like uh, understanding what does God's word say? Why does it say it? The Bible talks about it all throughout the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, that believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in another tongue. What are they talking about? What is another tongue? Why are they doing that? Is, was that then? Is that today? Here, here's where studying it and understanding comes into place. And hopefully I'm just prodding you with all these questions that I'm not taking time to give answers to right now. I'm doing that on purpose. I, wanna, I want us to, to grow in a desire to, to not just see it and, and just see it, but, but understand it. What does this mean? What is God really trying to say here? It's vital that we grow in understanding. I saw a quote the other day that terrified me because I believe it's so true. Here's the quote. Our generation is just about three questions away from their entire worldview being shattered. I, I, I'm fearful because I think this is true of a lot of Christians. I think many Christians turn away from the faith because we, we have questions that we don't have answers to. There's questions people ask you about your faith or about the scripture that you don't have an answer to. And, and because of, if we don't grow in understanding, we're not gonna be able to, defend our faith like the scripture says. We're not gonna know why we believe what we believe. That terrified me. This generation is three questions away from their whole worldview being shattered. Part of my goal as your pastor over the next year as we talked about to grow in spiritual depth is to help our church in this journey to know why we believe what we believe. What does God's word say? Why, why do we do the things we do? do? Do we really believe what the Bible says? And, and if we do, why do we believe it? And what does that mean for our lives? It's growing in understanding. It's growing in understanding. I need to know what the Bible says, but I also need to know why the Bible says it. And we don't just approach it with humility, we don't just approach it with the desire to understand, but the third way we're gonna approach God's word over these next few weeks in 3 John is we're gonna approach God's word with the willingness to submit. With the willingness to submit. We're gonna say, God, I'm coming to you humbly. Lord, I desire for you to teach me to, so I can understand what your word says. And now, God, whatever I discover, whatever I understand from your word, I'm actually gonna respond to. It's actually kind of a flow of logic if you think about it. If, if I'm gonna humbly approach God to hear what he has to say, not me, but him, and then if I'm gonna grow deeper in understanding what it says, my next step would be I would have to respond to it. Why would I wanna know what God says and why would I wanna grow in understanding of it if I don't plan on doing anything with it? So, so I, I need to understand it and find I need to be willing to submit to God's word. James says it like this in James chapter one, verse number 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Now let's look at the context of this a little bit. Who is James? Well, James is the little brother of Jesus. <laughs> all my siblings out there, all my siblings. James is the little brother of Jesus. All right, so let's just, let's just grip our mind around this scripture a little bit. James is saying, hey, you're gonna hear what God has to say. By the way, he's talking about his brother, okay? You're gonna hear my brother's words. And he goes, don't just hear them, do them. Like, do what he's saying. Now look, again, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to walk some of you through this because some of you haven't got it yet. There's a little brother telling everyone listening, everyone he can write to, he's telling the church, he's telling other believers, hey, everyone, listen to my big brother. 
obey my big brother. Now again, talk about supernatural. Talk about like, how, there, there are no little brothers watching that are posting and declaring to the world and everyone around them for everyone to listen to and worship and submit to their big brother. It is not happening. My two little brothers are not doing any such thing. It is not happening. How many know if a little brother is declaring uh, to everyone in the church, hey, listen to my brother, submit to him. How many know there's some, there's some power behind that this thing must be real this thing must he must he must have seen some things in his brother he must have witnessed some things he he must have seen the supernatural power of God and it's like to be declaring to everyone to 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 listen to and obey and submit to his big brother see the context of it gives you some more power behind it. We, we need to, as James said, we're not just gonna hear the word. We're not just gonna hear what Third John instructs. No, 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 we're gonna submit to it. And there's a funny perception nowadays in our culture that is around the idea of submission. There's some words that come to mind in our culture when you hear the word submission. Uh, the words are probably weak, soft, spineless, there's a negative stigma about submission, but actually that could be farther from the truth. There, there's power in submission. Like even for example, if there was a guy and he walked through the front door of, of our lobby right now as we're filming the service and he walked in and said, hey, my name is Bob. I need to have a talk with you and inspect this place. I'd say, all right, Bob. Sorry, sir, we're filming service. You want to join the extra sheet? Like, come on, Bob, part of the church family. Like, now, how many know if Bob came in and he had a badge on that said Federal Bureau of Investigation and he flashed and said, hello, my name is Bob. I need to have a conversation and inspect this place. How many know that changes the conversation? The conversation changed not because his name changed, not because his demeanor changed, not because his verbiage and how he asked a question changed. No, the, the conversation changed because of the, the authority he submitted to. As, as, as a person under the authority of the FBI, he, Bob doesn't get to do whatever he wants. No, Bob is submitted to the greater authority, the greater government. And because he's submitted, he's now got more power and more authority than he would if he was not submitted. As is true as a follower of Jesus. As followers of Christ, if you are submitted, if you come underneath the authority of God's word, if you come underneath the authority of Christ and his example and his love and his instructions for your life, it, it doesn't make you weak, it doesn't make you spineless, it doesn't, it, no, 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 it gives you more authority. It gives you more power when you submit to Christ. You carry more authority under submission than you do when you're out of submission. The world around you will tell you that if you're under authority, you're weaker, but in the kingdom, as a follower of Jesus, I want you to write this down, you're stronger when you're submitted. You're stronger when you're submitted. So, so here's the journey we're gonna go on over the next few weeks. We're gonna look at this short, short book of 3 John. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna approach it with a spirit of humility. God, what do you... What do you want to say to me? God, I don't want to put my preferences on your word. God, I want to hear what your word has to say. I'm going to approach it with the spirit of humility. We're going to desire understanding. We're going to study it. We're going to ask questions. We're going to look at the context. We're going to see, see what God's word is really saying. We're going to go a little bit deeper than just knowing it. We're going to understand it. And finally, my prayer for our church, our church family, and everyone that's watching this morning or, or, or the playback or the podcast, wherever you're watching, my prayer is that we're not just going to hear it or understand it, but that we're going to submit to it. We say, God, whatever your word says, over this next month and period, whatever your word says, it, 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 it forever, as long as I've got breath in my lungs, Lord, I'm going to submit to your word. I'm going to submit to your word. For a few moments, I want us to respond, just to have a own moment of submission 
in our own hearts, wherever you are, sitting on your couch, sitting at your kitchen table, in your car. I'm going to ask Chris, he's going to lead us in this. And just take a moment to submit your own heart to the Lord. As we prepare for this next month, we're going to, we're going to submit ourselves to what God's Word says. We're going to grow in understanding. We're going, to, we're going to come under what God's Word says as we look at this book over the next month. So come on, let's sing this out. Let's take a few minutes to surrender. Come on, right there where you are. Surrender to Jesus this morning. Let's sing that together one last time this morning. Lord, we give you our whole life. All that we are, Lord. Every single part of us today, Lord, we give it to you. Father, we do surrender all that we are to you today. Lord, in different homes and at different spaces and places all throughout our city and Lord, all throughout our nation, Lord, as people are tuning in, Lord, we we just take a moment right where we are and we just submit all that we are to you. Lord, we submit our own preferences. We submit our own agendas. And Lord, we just ask That as we journey together through this one chapter of your word over the next few weeks, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to grow in understanding. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to walk in submission to what we're learning and to what we're hearing from you through your word. And Lord, I pray for every single person on the other side of this screen that's watching. Lord, I pray for them this week in their heart. Lord, I pray that they would live a life fully surrendered to you. There's some people watching right now. Maybe you haven't surrendered your heart to Jesus. Maybe you haven't made him the Lord and leader of your life. Maybe today you don't need a pastor to convince you that you've sinned and that you've missed the mark and you realize that you can't be the forgiver of your own sins. You can't be the leader of your own life. And maybe today, right in your home, as you're watching this, you need to surrender your heart to Jesus. I love that God is not confined by geography and by space. He'll save you right where you are. He'll forgive you right where you are. He'll make you a new creation right where you are. He'll He'll make you in Christ right where you are today. There's some of you, you need to make that decision today. You need to surrender your heart to Christ for the very first time. There's, there's some others watching you've surrendered your heart to Jesus, but you're not currently living in submission to God's word. You are living by your preferences. You are living by your own agenda. You are living by your own way and your own desires and your own wants. And today God is saying to you to surrender your own desires, surrender your own preferences, surrender your own agenda and submit come underneath the lordship and the word of God it's 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 better for your life you can trust God with your life you may have been burned by people in authority before but God is a good father who wants to lead you into good things he leads us into green pastures into still waters he restores your soul some of you today need to surrender fresh to him everything in your life and trust him as God. Trust him as Lord. Trust him as a loving father that wants to lead you into a good, abundant life. This is what our church is about. This is why we do what we do. This is why our community gathers. And this is why we, we, because, because we want to live surrendered to God's word. So our whole church, I'm asking everybody right now, just with your palms open towards heaven, Lord, we surrender to you fresh today. Lord, I surrender to you fresh today. Lord, every single person sitting here physically in the room with me today, God, we're surrendering to you today. We want what you want for our lives. We want your will, your word, your way. 
God, because there's nothing like your way. Your ways are better than ours. Your ways are higher than ours, and that's what we desire. Lord, we love you. Thank you again for the opportunity to gather today virtually. Thank you for every single person that's tuned in. Thank you for their life, Lord. Bless them this week. Lord, pour out your presence in their home, in their family, in their life this week. Lord, I pray you bless them. I pray you'd protect them in Jesus' name. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Hey, Oasis Church, thank you for tuning in to Church Online with us today. I'm excited about this short season that we've got as this place gets ready to open to our city very soon. We can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to tune in next Sunday for Church Online again. You can check the podcast this week as well. We love you, church. We'll see you soon.